And so next time you hear that voice, I want you to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This is the attitude that we are called to do as we begin Holy Mass. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I am not going to be doing the talking. You're going to be the doing the talking, and I am going to be listening to what you have to say. And that's where we start the practical part of our little our presentation today. How does silence then play a role in the Mass? Well, the first thing is silence before Mass is sacred silence. Remember we talked about sacred, it's like set apart, it's something different. And so this kind of silence is silence with a purpose, silence of preparing us for what is about to happen, because it is crazy awesome, and we don't want to do something important without first entering into it with silence. I sacrificed a lot to get ready for this talk. I took four hours out of my time, out of my day today, to go on to an experiment of the importance of silence. So I went down to Turf Valley and I played 18 holes. And I want to say, first of all, it was ungodly hot. But nevertheless, it struck me over and over again as you're getting ready for those little putts that are going to make a birdie or a par or maybe even to a triple bogey. And they become very, very important. And you do not talk during that. You don't have other people talking. People generally understand this is important. I'm not going to talk. I'm going to be silent. When we go to movies, we know something needs going to happen. I'm going to be silent. I'm not going to be talking. When you go in to prepare for something really big or important, you're not gabbing off and on. You're preparing yourself and focusing yourself. And that's what, ha what certainly happens on the golf course all over the time. And so when something important happens, it's only natural and human for us to say, I need to prepare myself. I need to settle down. I need to be in silence for a while so that I can really think about this and really recognize its importance and understand what I'm about ready to undertake. And I want to I, I dial in, basically, is what you want to do. And so that's the, that's the first thing part that silence comes into the Mass. It's not during the Mass at all. It's before the Mass. We really, really should have some opportunity from silence before Mass. Now, I know this is not, depending on what parishes you are, not always the easiest thing to do. We've got big parishes, lots of people, and sometimes people are coming in, hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm singing forever. How you? What's your wife doing? Going all the way. That's great. And they're talking, and you're trying to sit there and pray and enter into this sacred silence, and it's hard to do. Um, and it really should encourage, you should encourage your priests, encourage people to try uh, to kind of still an atmosphere of silence. Sometimes a little prayer five minutes before over the ambo can do wonders to kind of get people quieted down if you need to. At St. Paul's we're pretty good about this just because I think the architecture and nature of our church allows for a little bit more quiet. People know when they come into church that they, uh, they should be quiet. But I've seen people sit in their, their cars out in the parking lot at other parishes and, you know, with the AC running, of course, and say, I'm not going in there until it's time for Mass begin because I'm preparing for Mass out here in my car. I'm getting ready for it because it's something special and I don't want to just be kind of going in there and just kind of talking about whatever else is going on and not really sit there and focus on uh, what's about ready to happen, which is, which is awesome. So that first silence is the silence uh, before Mass. The second thing, the silence also takes part all throughout the Mass with instructions. Instructions that are actually spoken out loud. For example, at the very beginning of the penitential rite, which is right before we say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, usually the priest will say something to the effect of, let us take a moment now to call to mind our sins, which is usually immediately followed by, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Unless none of you have any sins, or at least you know them right away, that's not giving you enough time. I follow this, everybody falls in this mistake, but the reality is Mass is meant to actually do the things that are asked of us. So when, when we say, let us call to mind our sins, there should be a pause. There should be a moment for you and I to do that, to call to mind our need for God's mercy our need for forgiveness, the times that we have sinned. And then after a, a period of silence, then we should go into the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Also, another big fa fault of a lot of, a lot of places is when we say, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this wonderful day. But that let us pray is meant to be followed by a pause. Let us pray is an invitation for me and for you to engage in private prayer. And then the next prayer that comes after, let us pray, is traditionally called the collect. Why is it called the collect? Because it's collecting all of these prayers 
going in the hearts and minds of all of these people and uniting them together with the presider or the priest prayer that is given to us by the church and given then to God. So let us pray should always be preceded by some, or what is it, followed by a moment of some silence where we can say, what am I bringing to the Lord in this Mass? What am I, you know, what's this feast of the visitation today mean to me? You know, what is that, what is that, and we should be praying, thinking about maybe our own mothers or, or someone who has a child and is getting ready to give birth or whatever it might be. We're thinking about those people, we're thinking about ourselves. How am I going to bring Christ into the world today like Mary uh, brought Christ uh, to Elizabeth, uh, her cousin? So those are the things that we should be thinking about, and then we collect all those prayers together and we offer them to God. But far, far too often we say, let us pray, and then we immediately start right into the opening prayer, and we don't get an opportunity to add our prayers to that prayer of uh, the Christ the head uh, in representing the priest. Now the readings. The readings, for the liturgy of the word, there's lots of opportunity for silence. Uh, the first thing is, we should have read the readings before Mass, right? Okay, <laughs> let's just get that out of the way. But I know that that's not a sometimes a possible reality for a lot of people, or some people just forget. But really, that's always the, the number one uh, goal. But there, I'm conscious of the fact, and maybe you are too, just through your own personal experience, that, that I don't always get a time to read those readings before Mass. So the first time that you are hearing these, these readings from the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, from the Gospel, sometimes obscure parts of the Gospel or the text that you might not have heard of. Remember, you'll read the entire Bible if you go to church for three years. So, I mean, you're going to see pretty much almost all of it uh, presented to you at Mass. So... Um, so what you should do is we should have silence after the readings. Now in a proclamation, even if you have read the readings, one of the cool things about Mass is during the proclamation of the reading, hopefully uh, something new might strike you. We have one of our best lectors in the whole world over here, Christine, who does a fantastic job reading. She sounds like St. Paul when she's reading. And I don't know how many times I've got like my homily prepared. She reads a reading from St. Paul. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm totally off. That's not what he meant at all. I, I should try to word rework this. Because somehow she, in the proclamation of it, a new word strikes you or a, a phrase, the way that it's presented or proclaimed. And so we should be able to chew on that for a little bit. We shouldn't go right from the first reading into the responsorial song. Because the first reading, something strikes you, before you can even think about it for a moment, the singer's up there ready for the responsorial song, and you're, you're off to the races. And all that, that good kind of proclamation and the spirit moving you in that first reading is now kind of evaporated in the air. And you don't have that opportunity to say, what was it that God was really speaking to me in that uh, prophet Hosea and his marriage to Gomer or whatever it might be. So, um, so, that's a, so that's something that we have to be careful of. But that also gives us a, a chance to look at the way the liturgy of the word is structured. There's a first reading and then the responsorial psalm. And as I've mentioned, there should be a pause between there, right? So first reading, pause, responsorial psalm. The psalm is a response to the first reading, picked for that reason, and also to match up with the gospel, all right? And that's a very important part. Everything in the, the liturgy of the word has a response. It's not meant for you to just kind of hear it and say, ah, that's it, good, no, what's the next thing? So we engage in the response to our psalm. It should be something we sing. It should be something we get into because it's trying to reflect some themes that might have been present in the, in the Old Testament. So then the second reading also has a response. What is the church's response to the second reading? Anybody? It's right in the germ, general instruction of the Roman Missal. It is silence. Silence is the response appropriate for the second reading. They figure, look, you, it's the New Testament. You should probably get it a little bit better than the Old Testament. We're not going to do another psalm. Sometimes there's something called a sequence, but most of the time it's silence. It is silence is the res pro appropriate response to the second reading. It should be profound silence. It shouldn't be the word of the Lord, alleluia, and then we get ready for the gospel. It should be the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, and then some silence to chew on this awesome text of the New Testament. Which leads us then, of course, into the gospel. What is the response to the gospel? Besides some brief moments of silence is... But that's praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, is our response. But what is the, the like liturgical response to the reading of the gospel? 
the homily, exactly, there you go. So the homily is the response to the gospel. The gospel, silence, and we have the, the homily. Um, there should be some response, uh, some silence after the homily. So basically what we're doing is we're making a bunch of Oreo cookies, right? We've got the first reading, silence, response, Oreo song. Second reading, response, Oreo gospel, uh, excuse me. Second reading, silence, then the gospel. Then the gospel, silence, the homily. Homily, silence, and then we go into the prayer of the faithful. And again, here is another opportunity for us to pray as a faithful community. And we, this is an opportunity for us to bring all of our prayers of the entire community to God. Um, and we should take some silence for that. Um, I, you know, I, it, I really get, uh, we do this at daily mass, and, and we add a few personal ones to our, our daily prayers. But it's always something that does kind of, um, you know, doing this talk made me think about some things I, I probably need to work on a little bit. But the prayer of the faithful is not meant to be pre-printed three years ago in a, some book that is now shipped to you and, and, and you read at the, at the Eucharistic, at the daily mass. Uh, the prayer of the faithful is meant to be exactly that, the prayer of the faithful. So, you know, to not have something like what happened in the Midwest with violent storms and things like that in your daily mass prayers of the faithful because you're reading something that was printed two years ago is not really the prayer of the faithful. It's the prayer of the two guys and one lady who sat together and made this prayer of the faithful handout that they sent three years ago to you. And that's not what the church is really after. So there should be an opportunity in the Mass to be able to really have an opportunity for the faithful to pray. And most of the times that's in silence because you don't want the Mass to go on forever, right? You don't want now, and there's parishes around that do this, you know, now let us voice our own intentions. And then you're in for an hour. And, uh, but uh, they're good prayers, of course, and it's the real prayer of the faithful. Of course, you have to watch out for those like, you know, pray for Barney that he might re-educate the children and blah, 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 or something either weird or the UFOs might come and save us all from the world. Thanks be Lord, hear our prayer. You know, like, oh my God. So you don't want to do that for lots of reasons, but certainly um, for the prayer of the faithful, it should be silent so that at least in your hearts you can bring to the altar of God the things that you care about, the things that you want to offer to God. And you should have that opportunity. Um, and again, prayer of the faithful should be composed by the faithful. And it should be something that we should, as priests, either explicitly go out and ask people, what do you need to pray for? Or it should be something that we get together, groups of people like this, and we say, okay, what should we pray for? What's on your mind? You know, um, you, having a hard time with jobs, and, or whatever it might be. And then we incorporate that into the prayer of the faithful. Um, but without having that, we need to have silence uh, to be able to do that. 